Today, a look at David and Goliath. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. I recently uh, spent some time out in El Paso, and church out there, Life Church uh, in El Paso, was going through uh, the historical books, going through 1 Samuel. And I got to fill in for the pastor a couple of uh, weeks and uh, looked fresh at 1 Samuel 16 through 21, basically. And so I was covering uh, mostly David and Goliath uh, in the first week. And then uh, the immediate events following that in the second week. And so I can imagine this will take a couple of episodes to cover. One of the items uh, about David and Goliath that's most interesting and I find most transformative in the reading of the passage and understanding what this part of the text is about, uh, we, we, we have talked about before. And if not in the episodes themselves of the podcast, Uh, on the radio uh, before. And so it's a fascinating part of the story that's completely overlooked. Uh, I just don't see it written about anywhere, talked about among others. So uh, we'll bring it up again and cover it here. But all of us know how we normally read these historical uh, accounts, these narratives in the historical books of the Old Testament, because David and Goliath is sort of the perfect example of it. When Uh, You just take the story and read it and then uh, make it an allegory or a metaphor of something that seems important to us. So with David and Goliath, the most obvious one that everybody uses always, and it's a really nice illustration, it's a really nice metaphor, uh, is David the weak, Goliath the mighty, powerful one, and David wins the battle, and so the underdog comes out on top and What a glorious testimony to God's favoring the underdog, you know, that kind of thing. There are, there is a lot to say in favor of that. There are plenty of passages in the Old and the New Testament where God makes clear that he favors the weak. The reason for that is not that the weak are more acceptable to God, but because they don't have anyone taking up their cause. So every time God talks about orphans and widows and strangers, he's saying that. I care about those who are somehow underrepresented in some way. So there's great value in that. There's no harm in that whatsoever. My point is, and I don't want to go uh, trudging through that whole issue, uh, but my point is to say, but that's not what David and Goliath is about. Now, it doesn't hurt to use David and Goliath to illustrate that, to the extent that we're not too abusive of the text itself, which we sort of are, because David's not really a weakling. So regardless of what Goliath thinks about him, David is a very powerful person in the story, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's just take it the way we all heard it in vacation Bible school, you know, scrawny little David walks out just barely able to stand on his own legs at this point in his poor life, and, and Goliath, you know, the mountain of a man standing against him, and Goliath is a mountain of a man. Uh, and so we come to this conclusion. So why do people do that? It's not because David and Goliath asks to be taught that way. And when I say David and Goliath in that case, I mean the text. The text isn't asking to be taught that way. There's nothing in the text that says that's the point that God wants to make here. We have to conclude that on our own. The reason we do it is because we know that lesson from elsewhere, that God takes up the cause of those who are underrepresented. And so we say to ourselves, well, what would be an example of that? Oh, remember when he took up the cause of David, when he was standing against Goliath. And so we use it as an illustration. This is what we normally do when we're reading Old Testament passages or when we're reading any story. We use that story as the illustration for a point that's made elsewhere in Scripture. 
And that's just sort of what we've learned to do historically. And so that's not the only way to gain a lesson from a narrative passage. There actually is a method for studying narratives so that you come to the conclusion of that text. And, the, and, and by the way, it's a simple process. I'm not going to lecture on this right now, but it's induction. Induction is reasoning that you do when you see one example after another, and then you finally draw a conclusion. So the sun rose, ro- rose Monday, the sun rose Tuesday, the sun rose Wednesday. I think the sun is going to rise every day. That's inductive reasoning. So when you're doing a narrative, which by its nature, normally, sometimes they do, if they're very didactic, they'll have a lesson written into them. And God told us the story because he wanted us to learn X. And then we know X. He does that in a lot of places, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you you finish the story and the story just moves to the next story. Then how are you supposed to figure out what the lesson or the lessons of that story was or were? And the answer is inductively. You read that story and the next one and the next one, and because they have comparable elements in them, you can understand the point that was being made. And so in studying narratives, this is one of the things I've done for a long time, in studying narratives, you learn to recognize the elements that are always present and then see the parallels in those elements in stories that are next to each other or refer to each other or stuff or, or, or embedded in each other, things like that. So in this story, David and Goliath, we all know the story. You know, Saul and the people of Israel are on one mountain and they're pitched against the Philistines who are on the other mountain. And I could give a lot more detail to that, but you know the basics of the background of the story. And then the giant Goliath comes down and plays the role of the champion. You know, why should all of our armies fight when we can just have a champion represent us? And this idea of the Messiah, especially being the champion for the people of God, should make more sense in that light. So Goliath goes down, you know, give me someone to fight. And then uh, if he wins, we'll be your servants. And if I win, you'll be our servants and save everybody else's life, right? So uh, he offers, nobody's willing to fight. You know the, the rest of the tale. I mean, Saul's sitting up there. He should fight, but he doesn't. And David's brothers are up there. They should be willing to fight, but they're not. And so everybody's just kind of waiting to see what happens. Then David shows up bringing cheese and things for his, for his family, for his brothers, because his dad sends him with uh, things to serve his brothers at the, at the battlefront. It's not like you have logistics lines for the you know, army supplies. And so, uh, you know, he's running in there to bring supplies to his brothers. He hears the Goliath. He says he'll do it. And he goes out on the, on the field and fights the battle and wins. And then all of Israel joins in it and chases the Philistines down and so on. So you know the story of David and Goliath. I'm not going to retell the whole thing, but I am going to retell elements of it, reading them to you in just a moment. The thing you might not have noticed, if you haven't ever laid the pieces of the story next to each other, it just might not jump out at you that this is the case, that the way the story is told centers around three exchanges of armor or clothing. And this is the part that I've mentioned before. So this is just a beginning for us. We'll continue uh, with some more information from it as we go along. But these three exchanges of armor or garments, and they are they are armor every time, but also some garments involved, uh, they break the story into the pieces that consistently show up in the accounts of David's throne, in the accounts of David's monarchy or his being the Messiah, as it turns out, in the Old Testament. And so you'll recognize the three exchanges. First is the one with Saul that doesn't take, right? So when David goes up to, you know, he's telling the other soldiers, what's going on? This guy's challenging us. Nobody's responding. Why not? And what's the king going to do for the person who's willing to go out and fight? I mean, I'm willing to do it. I killed a bear. I killed a lion. I can kill this Philistine too. And they say, hmm, maybe we should let you speak with Saul. And so David speaks with Saul, and this is how that part of the account goes. Uh, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from his flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth, and if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. 
Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. And we'll come back and talk about it. But, the, the, you know, these, this is not a small child who doesn't know how to do things. He's, he's killed wild animals, and not just with good fortune. He's killed them because he was protecting his sheep and he knew how to do it. And so, he, so David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Okay, go, and Yahweh be with you. Go represent us. You're, you're our champion. Go forth. But then Saul offers David his clothes. Saul clothed David with his armor. Now, again, when I was a kid, vacation Bible school, all the illustrations were this you know nine-year-old child trying to put on an adult's armor and not able to even hold up the sword. And, oh, I can't fight with these. They're too big for me. It was just it was just the most ridiculous thing looking back on it. It's like, why did people say that? And I don't know. It's just been hand down from generation to generation, I suppose. The point is, that's not what goes wrong here. David is able to use Saul's armor. Later, David is able to use Goliath's sword for crying out loud. He can certainly use Saul's sword. So the stuff can fit. It, it is something he could use, but he hasn't used it. It's not his. So this is what happened. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he, ha- for he had not tested them. That, that's completely different from saying he couldn't use them, but they weren't his. They did not belong to him. They were not what he was used to fighting with. So he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I can't go with these. I have not tested them. So David put them off. Saul tries to give David his armor, and David puts it off. And in literary terms, this is obvious. I mean, if we were reading this in a work of fiction, which this is not, we would all say, oh, well, you know what that means? That's a form of identification of the characters, and he's, he's taking his role. Well, that is what it would represent here. He's taking Saul's place on the battlefield. Saul could go down and represent Israel as the great king who goes out to lead his people, as he already had in the past. But he's not willing to do that. So David is willing to do it. So, well, David should put on the king's armor, and he should go down. But instead, David took his staff in his hand. We'll come back and and give some more detail to that. I won't give as much detail to the other two, but just so you know where we're going, the next exchange of armor is after David has killed Goliath because it says David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. He claims the armor of Goliath, who he's defeated on the field. And then the third exchange, and this one's really obvious as well, is after all of that's over, then Jonathan loves David as his own soul. And this is what it says. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So David gets the armor from Jonathan. There there are three different exchanges in this little section at the end of chapter 17 in 1 Samuel and the beginning of chapter 18 in 1 Samuel. There are three exchanges of armor that obviously break up this story and, as it turns out, also force our attention on these characteristics of the Messiah of David that are so important for us to understand what he was doing. So what are those characteristics? Number one, why doesn't he take Saul's armor? So this is the first exchange of armor. It's in 1 Samuel 17, verse 38, when he says, I've not tested this, I can't take this. And immediately after that, the narrator tells us in verse 40, after David put off Saul's armor, what does he take up? He could have said, and he took his sling and his stones. He could have focused on that because that's what he's going to end up doing. He's going to go down, and he does. He mentions those immediately after this. But the first words he says, after he says, David, put off that armor, it says, then he took his staff in his hand. He goes back to being the shepherd that he is. And remember, his brothers are going to make fun of him 
for this. His oldest brother is going to say to him at one point, I'll read this to you in a minute, go back and take care of those few sheep out in the wilderness that our father gave you the responsibility for. What are you doing here, you shepherd boy? That's what he's saying. And David, when Saul says, here, wear the king's armor, David says, yeah, I think I'll just take my shepherd's staff instead, because that's what I'm used to carrying. That and the five smooth stones from the book, uh, brook book, from the brook that he put in his shepherd's pouch and his sling in his hand before he goes and approaches the Philistine. In the, and the first point of this story is that David never becomes who he is not. David never does what's not his to do. He doesn't claim the throne when it's not his. And again, I'm not just picking this out as a point to make from this one statement. This one really important element of the story, because the repetition of the exchanges of armor, you can tell we're supposed to have our attention drawn to it, is a way of saying something that we're going to see over and over in the story, and that is that David refuses to take Saul's place no matter how many times he can do it, even when Saul is chasing David around to kill him and David is hiding in a cave that Saul goes into to cover his feet, I'm doing with air quotes so you can interpret it on your own, the point is when David is behind him, has a knife, can kill him, he can end the chase and take over the throne that he's been anointed to take over by Samuel already. When he can do all of that, he doesn't do it. We all know the story. Instead, he cuts off a little garment and says to Samuel, Saul, why are you chasing me around? I'm I'm nothing. I'm a dead dog. I'm a flea. Why would you bother with me? He, He refuses to take Saul's place. He never takes Saul's place because David never presumes for himself what is not rightfully his. Instead, he is who he is. So he refuses to do what's not his to do, and he remains instead a shepherd. Look how built into the story that is. I mentioned Eliab's statement. Uh, This is his oldest brother in verse 28. Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption, the evil of your heart, because you've come down to see the battle and so on. In the same way, when David responds to Saul after he has said, you know, I think I can go and fight this fight, and then they take him and they bring him before Saul, David says to Saul, don't let a man's heart fail him, uh, fail because of this Philistine, your servant, not, I'm a great champion, I can win, and then you'll owe me all this money. He doesn't do any of that. It's your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. The refusal uh, to accept Saul's armor is one of the statements of this. Verse 52, that this is in chapter 17 also. After he has gone down and fought with Goliath, immediately after he kills him, it says, when the Philistines saw their, Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout, and they pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. That statement is to make the point that David's battle against Goliath wasn't about David and Goliath. It was about Israel and Philistia. And the fact that David has gone out as their leader, he's their shepherd, he's serving them, he's serving the king. Now all of Israel is the one that's going to get the victory, not just David. So what he does, he does for them. And in the same way, by the way, what does David end up doing immediately after this? And and we're told this sort of out of sync with where the rest of the story is going to go after this, because starting in chapter 18, then David's going to have this long, complicated relationship with Jonathan and Saul that includes him playing music for Saul. But at the end of chapter 17, the author wants us to hear that David goes and starts playing music for Saul right after this. So, you know, so who is this? I don't know who it is. Oh, so go and find out who it is. Inquire who this boy is. This is after the, the defeating David and Goliath. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. David has won this great battle. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So this is, I'm not... Uh, I'm the mighty son of the Bethlehemite. We have our own village, and it's going to be named after me. He's not that. I am just the son of one of your servants. I'm no one. 
And he's willing to serve Saul in exactly that way, just as he serves his own father by being on that battlefield because his dad had sent him with the food for the men who were supposed to be fighting the battle and so on. You get the idea. David is a shepherd in this story, and even when he is winning the battle and knows that he can win the battle, he's not going to pretend to be anything other than a servant and a shepherd. It's not a minor thing that in Israel's history, the role of the great king, David, is him as the shepherd king. He will shepherd his people, Israel. This is what he does. So seeing this person who's, who, who refuses to become what they're not, but accepts who they are, the shepherd, is a huge part of what we're supposed to learn from David and Goliath. The other part, the second part of what we're supposed to learn, and, and certainly in the exchange of armor this happens, the second part of what we're supposed to learn is from the fact that David takes Goliath's armor, again in verse 54 of 1 Samuel 17, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Why does he take the Philistine's armor? Well, so this is the thing. I said a moment ago, the first thing you learn about David when you're paying attention to the story is that he doesn't become what he's not. So he knows he's a shepherd. He remains a shepherd. But the second thing to learn about David is that he does become what he is. (laughs) That is, he's willing to be the champion. He's going to win this battle. He's not going to kneel before Goliath and say, oh, I'm just a poor shepherd boy. Oh, you know, just have mercy on me. I can't really fight you. He doesn't do that. And David, this is the point. David's not pretending to be a mighty warrior. Oh, and 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 again, I appreciate the spirituality, I'm putting that in double quotes, with which we approach this when we say things like, well, David only won that battle because he knew to trust in the Lord and to pray. That's all good and fine, and he certainly trusts the Lord. He trusts Yahweh, and he gives Yahweh credit for what happens. But let's be cautious to say the truth about what the author in the text tells us actually happened, which is that David, with his skill and practice, kills Goliath because he is a mightier warrior than Goliath. And for the rest of the story, we're supposed to recognize that David is the mightiest warrior in Israel and probably all of Israel's history. There are accounts of the mighty men who serve under David that are like Greek mythology. I mean, they're killing so many people and conquering these inconquerable foes, and yet they are only among the top 10 or the top 50 or the top 100, and then David is mightier than all of them. They know he is the great warrior. And if you say, well, it's only because he'd already defeated Goliath. No, no, no. When David goes to tell Saul why he's willing to fight Goliath, he does not say, because I know how to pray and you should see me write a poem. I'm telling you. He doesn't do it. It's not spiritual. His response is, I know how to kill a lion. I know how to kill a bear. And if I can't do it with the weapons that are in my hands, I'll do it with my bare hands. I can kill things. Give me a chance to kill this Philistine. That's his argument with Saul. You can see it in verses 34 and following in chapter 17. And when he actually does go to prepare for the battle, he doesn't leave Saul and his armor and say, what I need is a prayer cloth, Saul. What he says is, now again, I'm not saying he doesn't pray, and I'm not saying he doesn't trust Yahweh but he puts feet to his prayers, as the old saying goes. And so what he does, he takes his staff and he takes his sling and his stones. And let's not, let's not trifle about this. When, having a projectile weapon, I mean, think about how rifles changed warfare. Think about how guns changed terrorism. All you have to do is know if you have a projectile like a stone in a sling and you know how to use it, think about the Benjamites who are bragged about because with their left hand, they can sling within a hair's breadth at 100 yards or whatever that distance is. All of those kinds of statements are saying these people have expertise. They are technical experts with a weapon. And David, because he is cunning, and has technical expertise with a weapon, kills Goliath. 
I'm not creating the story. I mean, this is, David said to the Philistine, you come, now look, again, total credit to Yahweh? Absolutely. Even his skill comes from Yahweh. Of course, that's the right thing to acknowledge. But listen to how this goes. David. Now, here's him acknowledging that it comes from Yahweh. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and a javelin, I come to you in the name of Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defied. This day, Yahweh will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down. I will cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. And by the way, I would love to go, and if we don't, we won't have time to do this today. But I would love for you to go and look at Psalm 68. Maybe we'll get a minute towards the end and we can go and refer to it. But in Psalm 68, David appears for all the world to be describing uh, uh, or writing a poem that is in response to his experience with Goliath, the whole Philistine confrontation there, everything about it. And so we'll talk about that more later. But But if you read Psalm 68 in the context of Goliath, It really comes to life, and we've talked about that before. Anyway, so I will strike you down. I will cut off your head. I'll give the dead bodies of the host of Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear because the battle is always his, and he will give you into our hands. Same author. What is that same author who had David say all of that to couch everything in? This is Yahweh's battle, and he's going to use me to win the battle. After he says all of that, what follows? David put his hand in his bag. This is in verse 49. Took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. That's not a, he closed his eyes and he turned around backwards and he just released it randomly and it happened to strike the Philistine. This is You know David knows how to hit somebody in the forehead with a stone. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground, and there's so much beautiful imagery in that uh, because of where the Philistines were standing on the mountain and where Israel was standing so that Israel was between the Philistines and Jerusalem. The, you know, Goliath, this mountain of a man, is bowing down now, his hands outstretched toward Jerusalem, You know, it's a beautiful image of the acknowledgement of the superiority of God's people now who have won the battle. But anyway, with all that said, so David prevailed over the Philistine with, this is the author's words in verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. So he struck the Philistine and he killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. This is not a surprise. Almost none of them had swords. Remember, if you remember earlier in this book, it describes the Philistines not allowing the Israelites to have any weapons. The Israelites themselves didn't have any blacksmiths. And so when they needed, uh, you know, a hoe sharpened or something, they would have to go to the Philistines to get it sharpened. The Philistines didn't want them to have weapons. So nobody had weapons except Jonathan and Saul, maybe a handful of other people in all of Israel. So it's absolutely no surprise that David does not have a sword. Remember, Jonathan's going to give him his sword in the next section that we talk about. So at this point, not a surprise. There's no sword in the hand of David. David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, and he killed him and cut off his head with it. Now, I get the brutality of all of this, and it it is a brutal time, and we could talk about that another time. But the point here is that David, when he wins this battle, doesn't slink back to Saul and say, oh, your humble servant is just so ashamed that I went out and fought this battle. Perhaps you should go and take the giant's head. Perhaps you should take his armor. No. Not only does he take off Goliath's head and, and apparently start carrying it around because he takes it all the way back to Saul's tent with him, remember, at the end. Not only is that happening, but he, and this almost sounds secretive, takes Goliath's armor back to his own tent. This is mine now. I have won this battle. My point is, David does do what he is supposed to do. He doesn't do what he's not supposed to do. He doesn't pretend to be king when he's not. 
He's not going to act like he's the king when he's not, and he's not going to take the throne when it hasn't been given to him. And this is, again, after he's been anointed by Samuel to be the next king, but not this king, the next king. So he leaves that to God to deal with Saul. So he doesn't do what he's not supposed to do, but he does do what is his to do. He steps onto the field, and he fights the battle, and he uses his skills, and he claims the championship when he's won the championship. This is David becoming the champion on the field. So just like in the first point, David is a shepherd, and he knows he's a shepherd. In the second point, David becomes a champion because he has won on the battlefield. And when I say champion, I mean it in the literal sense, not just that he won and he gets first prize because of it, which apparently is carrying around a trophy of a head, but he is the champion for Israel. He's leading them into battle. And that's the image that we're going to have from now until Saul dies, that David is leading Israel to one victory after another over the Philistines or any of the enemies of Israel because God has made him the champion. I'm saying all of that because we just have such a supercilious way of claiming that we don't do anything. Oh, only Yahweh does things through us. I love the truth that we can't breathe without Yahweh giving us breath. We don't have a moment of our lives that God doesn't give to us. So that's right. There's there's no problem with that whatsoever. When I say it becomes supercilious, I mean it like when we are looking down on someone who says, now, I, I won't even say this. What I'm about to say, I won't say because I'm so well-trained in our mentality about this that I become supercilious in the same way. We won't say what Paul says in Scripture. Paul says, you know, when I'm this or that in this or that context, I take on all these different roles and ways of doing things so that I might by all means save some. And the nature of that statement in Greek and English is active. Paul does it, that I might save some. Does he pretend that he is the Savior in that passage? Of course not. Does he act as if Jesus isn't the source of the salvation? Of course not. Would there be any sense in which he would not acknowledge that only in the power of the Holy Spirit does anyone come to salvation? Of course not. But he also knows that if he's not doing his part, then he's failing. And so he says, so I do my part, so that by whatever means is necessary, I might save those I can. Again, it's not an es- it's not it's not some soteriological statement that he's making about the nature of salvation itself, but it is him acknowledging that we have to do what we can do. And often as Christians, when if we take if we if we grasp the level of our dependency on the action of God for anything to happen. And that's an honest grasping. We should grasp. Everything is contingent on God. Once we grasp that, unfortunately, we release any sense of how responsible we are within God's creative power, how responsible we are for acting with the force that God has given us. And so we sit on our hands and say, I wonder when God is going to solve this problem. While all the time, God is sending boat after boat by the house to save us from the drowning. Not going to retell the joke. You get the idea. I mean, I can't do anything without God, but God expects me to do what I can with what he's given me. And what he had given David was skill and power and force and courage and just knowledge to be able to step into the battle and win this fight with Goliath. Okay, so there's number two. Number one, David doesn't do what he's not supposed to do. He doesn't become king when he's not king. He's a shepherd. Two, he does become what he's supposed to become. He does do what he's supposed to do. He becomes the champion. When he's supposed to fight, he fights. When he's supposed to act, he acts. And that's how we should be as well. By the way, not just because we're us, but because we're supposed to follow the example of Christ, who does these same things, obviously. David being the Old Testament form of the Messiah, he doesn't purchase anyone's atonement on a cross, 
but he is the Old Testament Messiah. And in the New Testament, Christ, our Messiah, is our example. He does these things. We should follow his example. The last one, the third exchange of armor and garments, in this case, with Jonathan, is so profound because it shifts everything. I mean, David doesn't do what he's not supposed to do. He does do what he's supposed to do, where he's supposed to go from there, right? What could the third exchange be about? Well, the third exchange, when Jonathan loves him as his own soul and strips himself, Jonathan strips himself of his own robe that was on him and gives it to David along with his armor and his sword and his bow and his belt, when Jonathan gives all of that to David, what does it represent? Well, I think to understand it, you have to compare this story with one other story. Again, I mentioned this on the radio years ago, and so hopefully you've heard this before, but it's profoundly obvious once you see it. Jonathan, unlike Saul, I mean, Saul has already forfeited any rightful claim to the future of Israel's throne because he's made it about him. It's all selfish. Oh, Samuel, I was afraid the people were going to leave me, and so I just thought, well, I'll be disobedient to God, but surely I can keep the people following me. I mean, Saul has become completely selfish in his position. That's going to become obvious as we talk about it in the next episode also because he wants, he wants the throne not just for him, but for Jonathan and everyone following him. It's about him and his lineage, not about what God's plan is for Israel. So Saul has forfeited his right to be the king going forward. So we all, we all know that. Jonathan hasn't. Jonathan hasn't done any of that. He's completely faithful. He is courageous. He's skilled. He's proven everything that David proves at David and Goliath. He proves all of that in a battle that he has with the Philistines. Just a few chapters before this, four chapters before this, when Saul is telling all the people, you know, we're not going to fight, we're going to fast, we're not doing anything. Jonathan, with his armor bearer, is saying, without knowledge of everything else that's going on, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, you know, I, I don't know why we would just hide here. Let's go fight. So he goes out and he finds, you know, a hill where there's a garrison of Philistines and he says, Now, what we're going to do is go up on that hill and kill the Philistines. So let's look for a sign from God. And the Philistines sort of fulfill the sign. Hey, come up here and we'll show you a thing. You remember the the story. And what does Jonathan do? So with his armor bearer, which essentially means he's by himself, Jonathan goes up and fights this whole garrison of Philistines, killing 20 or so of them in a single strike. And all of it, just exactly like David conquers Goliath, I mean, fighting 20 people, yourself in a little space of a field and winning the battle, them all being dead around you, is as great as defeating one giant. And so Jonathan has his great moment of victory as the champion for Israel's future. And Israel sees it. And in exactly the same way, they chase the enemies off. And Jonathan has led the people to a great victory. And the people are celebrating Jonathan. And they even protect him against Saul when they come back and so on. All of that said and done, Jonathan's a perfect candidate to be the king for Israel going forward. There's nothing negative about him. But he gives his armor to David. Why? Because Samuel didn't hunt down Jonathan and anoint Jonathan to be the next king over Israel. Samuel hunted down David and anointed him to be the next king over Israel. But Jonathan can see David is Israel's champion. And so Jonathan lays his armor down at David's feet and says, this is yours now. You are the rightful heir. You know why that is? It's for the reason that in chapter 16, David is anointed, the next king of Israel, because he's the one God chose. That's it. You can say, well, that that sounds circular. I mean, you didn't answer the question. Why did God choose him? I'm not answering that question. None of us can ever answer that question. He is the chosen one. And there's only one chosen one. That's the point. Jonathan is just as good as David, just as worthy as David, and yet he's not the chosen one. It is so. When I said the first point of the exchange of armor with Saul, the one that doesn't go through, is that David doesn't become what he's not. He doesn't do what he's not supposed to do. The second one with Goliath, he does do what he's supposed to do. He defeats the enemy. He's courageous. He uses his skills. He applies himself to accomplish what he's supposed to do. But the third one isn't about what David does at all or what Jonathan does. The third one is about what God does. God does what only God can do. God chooses him. 
God anoints him. God sets him apart. And this is the point. In setting him apart, he is saying, this is the one that you have to know. It All that matters in Israel is that they have that chosen one. Now, I know the way we think about this. We use the word so technically, and we're so theologically steeped in the language of election and chosenness that we apply it in all of these different ways. But I can tell you what this story is implying about David and what all of the New Testament implies about Christ. If you want to know what it means to be chosen, you just have to know what it is to be the Christ, because that's what it means to be the chosen one. When you are the anointed one, the Mashiach, the one that's anointed, the Creo Christo, the one that's anointed in the New Testament, Christ, in the Old Testament, Messiah, when you're the anointed one, it means you're the chosen one, the chosen one. And so then why is Israel included in this? Because they are following the chosen one. They are in the chosen one. This identification of the chosen one with his people is inherent. So again, it's not the way we think about the world, but it is the way scripture describes it. So that if, you know, if I, if I, I'm chosen, I, I'm chosen. Why? Because I'm in Christ. This is how Ephesians 1 talks about it. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Then you, you can add all the other details to it you want, but there are lots of people who are righteous. There are lots of righteous deeds that we do. But the only reason we are righteous in the eyes of God is because we are in Christ. And in exactly the same way, there, we're, I'm chosen. My producer is sitting over here across the room from me. She's chosen. Why are we chosen? Because we're in Christ, and he's chosen. And to be in him is to be chosen. So I just, it's not that complicated idea, but it's made obvious in this story about Jonathan and David when you see those two stories told next to each other and realize that Jonathan would have been in a perfectly good position from a human perspective to take over the throne. Saul dies, Jonathan becomes the heir, he's courageous, he's skilled, he is a great leader who is faithful, and yet, that's not who God chose. God chose David, and he became the great leader for Israel. So I I share all of that with you to get to this point that we're going to be pursuing in the episode that we'll take up next time so that we can finish it. What does it mean to be the chosen one? What does it mean to us for him to be the chosen one? Because what immediately follows this is Saul making David his enemy. But the people of Israel and Jonathan making him their champion and their friend. And Jonathan establishes this covenant with him. And as you can imagine, that's going to make all the difference in the world because we all know Saul's going to end up dead. Even Jonathan himself is going to end up dead, but not his lineage because of the covenant that he has with David, which is expressed so clearly. But everything from this point forward is going to be about who's with David and who's not with David in exactly that same way in Christianity. That's why we talk about this so importantly about Christ, the doctrine of exclusivity that only Christ is the means of salvation isn't hoarding salvation. It's not being stingy about salvation. It's simply pointing out the nature of God's declaration that his son is his chosen one that Christ is the one. And for us to be included is for us simply to be in Christ. There's the start to what we need to learn about David from David and Goliath. We'll take up what we learn about David from David and Saul and David and Jonathan and David and Michael and all of those others who are choosing their sides to be for or against him next time. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.